So in the 1800s, there was this scientific duo of platonic best friend roommates of Robert Bunsen, you know, of the Bunsen burner, and Gustav Kirchhoff, you know, of Kirchhoff's circuit rules, probably the most annoying problem you had to do in undergrad. Together, they developed a piece of equipment called a spectroscope. It looks something like this. You might be more familiar with a diagram that looks like this. So you have some sort of white light. It hits a grating. And because of the way photons work, when a photon hits a material, the angle with which it is refracted is dependent on the wavelength. So they use this tool to look at different samples of gases, and Kirchhoff develops these rules of spectroscopy. The first is that white light has a continuous spectrum. The second is that if you look at a gas, an excited gas that is emitting photons, it will have a unique spectra called an emission spectra because that gas is emitting light at certain frequencies. The third rule of spectroscopy is about absorption spectra. So if you take your white light and you put your sample right here and the light goes through it, when you look with your spectroscope, you are gonna see the continuous spectrum but with like black lines in it where that sample has absorbed very specific wavelengths. So Bunsen and Kirchhoff right away notice that every element they look at has a unique spectra. So if you look at hydrogen versus neon, you can tell what you're looking at. So this tool works to identify which element is in gases. And they use this tool to discover for the first time two new elements that would later be put on the periodic table, cesium and rubidium. Both of those are very, very important to modern physics experiments, but we don't have time to get into all that because this video is about spectra. At the fundamental level, spectroscopy is the measure of a variance of a parameter versus a frequency. So Bunsen and Kirchhoff were looking at intensity versus wavelength, and I think that's most commonly what people think about when they think of spectroscopy. They think of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, people can and they do all sorts of different spectroscopy. Like you have nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, you have like mass spectrometry, all different types of things that are all very important, all because this one tool was developed in the 1860s. This might be the most important piece of science equipment ever. That's a bold claim, but let's, let's, let's fight for it. So I talked about the difference in the emission and absorption spectrum. They look like this. However, modern spectrometers uh, don't really have these one-dimensional diagrams. We're usually looking at plots that look like this. So let's just recap how to read a plot really quick. So if you have wavelength on the x-axis, you're going to vary your parameter, which again I said is probably intensity. So on the y-axis you have something like intensity, on the x-axis you have something like wavelength, and you get a nice little curvy line. If it's a continuous spectra, you will see light emitted at all wavelengths, so it's a nice smooth curve. If it's an emission spectra, you're going to see sharp peaks at the specific wavelengths where light is emitted. And if it's an absorption spectra, you will see that smooth continuous, but with like little dips in it. So when you use a modern spectrometer, like, oh, I have one right here. That's the type of figure you're gonna get out of it. And this is very exciting news. This video is not sponsored by Thor Labs, but they did let me borrow this. This is a pretty expensive piece of equipment and they just let me borrow it. They just sent it to me and that's really nice. What I have here is the fiber optic cable that's attached to the spectrometer and your source just goes into this light. So I have my my lights here. If we put those on, well, let me start running it first. So at this moment, you don't really see any light. If I put it next to my little recording lights here, you see a nice kind of continuous spectra. Make it more intense by getting a little closer. But what if we looked at something, so this is a bluish, purplish one. We know what wavelength of light is bluish, purplish, right? It's like 400 to 500 nanometers. So if we plug this in, okay, it looks bluish, purplish. Oh, it looks really purple on camera. So let's take our spectrometer and try to measure the wavelength of light coming out of this guy. All right. So obviously it depends on what angle you're pointing like how close you are to actually pointing right at the light. But you can see this is about 397 nanometers and maybe 400 nanometers. And you can see that this peak 
if I could hold it stable, that would be amazing. This peak is kind of wide and it's not like a delta function. Um, that's because of the way LEDs work, right? It's putting out a spectrum around a certain frequency of light, but it's not as exact as maybe a laser would be. So, so what if we looked at a laser? A while ago, I filmed this video on the Faraday effect where I used this like crappy green laser that I bought on Amazon like 20 years ago. I mean, it's not 20 years ago, it's like 15 years ago. And uh, uh, in that same video, I talked a lot how I was super scared of magnets. And I got a bunch of comments that were like, you're scared of magnets. What you should be scared of is lasers. And uh, you think that I don't have laser goggles? <laughs> like I'm scared of magnets. Of course, I'm also scared of lasers, guys. So the reason I wanna put these goggles on is because I'm gonna try to shine this laser around this fiber optic cable. And this is made of glass and it's gonna reflect the light. And we don't want that in our eyes. So um, green is gonna be like, 550 to 600 nanometers. I don't know off the top of my head which like color is associated with which wavelength. Um, that's just not something I've memorized, but I think it's like 500 to 600. So let's see. Um, so this is green. I don't know. See, that's probably even bad to do. Um, so let's look at this fiber optic cable and I don't want to blow this out. I'm not going to shine the laser right into this. That would be bad, but let's see. Let's see if we can get a color out of it. So this is kind of interesting. So you can see it right at like 530, which is green, but you also see a second peak at like 823. That's interesting. Um, so that's in the infrared. That means that this is not a great laser. It's outputting at two different wavelengths. But what I'd like to do is go back and screenshot it so you can see that the laser peak is super smooth. Like it's coming out at a much more exact frequency than the LED peak, because that's just how these devices work at outputting light. I wish I had an argon lamp or something so I could show you like a very specific, like elemental spectra, but maybe another day. So spectra not only tells you what wavelength of light is coming out of an object. It also tells you, like in the case of LED versus laser, how this light is being produced. But you can learn even more from spectra. I think I've talked about this on my channel before, but of course you can use the Doppler effect to look at spectra to see if it's red shifted or blue shifted and tell the velocity of an object, whether it's moving away from you or whether it's moving toward you. I'm sure you've all heard the Doppler effect, but when you're teaching a class and you say something like the Doppler effect, you have to, you have to go over it again. So let's just do it. <laughs> you're going to make me wee woo. That's what I have to do. Okay. So the wobble in stars is observed with the Doppler effect in the emitted light of that star. We feel the Doppler effect most on earth with sound waves, like an ambulance. So, um, so when a sound wave is moving towards you, it is shifted to a higher frequency. So the pitch goes up a little bit. When a sound is moving away from you, it's shifted the other way. So the pitch goes down a little bit. We observe this, of course, with ambulances. So like if you're standing still on a corner and you hear an ambulance as it's coming towards you, it's like, wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. <laughs> and as it's going away, it's like, wee woo, wee woo. That, that's, that's what we observe. It's hard for me to do um, with my voice, but you, you know it, just picture that in your head. That's the Doppler effect. So the radial velocity method of exoplanet detection relies on the Doppler effect. I'm gonna go over this this plot. Okay. I got I gotta get serious. I'm gonna like sorry. <laughs> okay. So you have a star. It's this red guy right here. And orbiting that star, you have a massive planet, which is this blue guy right here. The planet is big enough that it causes the star to orbit a common center of mass, which is this little gray dot. The blue planet is not orbiting the star, it is orbiting the common center of mass, this gray dot. It's just gravity. So we're on Earth. We can't measure the planet, we can't see it. It's not as bright as the star, it's not giving off light. All we see is the star right here, and we take a look at its spectra, which looks like this, okay? If we turn our telescope back to the star sometime later, now it's over here. We might not even notice that it's changed position because this wobble is so small. But when we take the spectra, we see that because it's moving away from us now at a different velocity than it was before, 
all of the spectra is now red shifted. Notice this line here. In the spectra, you have this red line. Now that this whole thing got red shifted, that line is no longer visible to us. It's moved. From this, we can, we can measure the velocity of all the things in this system. So imagine you look at this system sometime later. Now the star is moving towards us. That means everything is going to be blue shifted. So if you look here, there was a little blue guy here when this wasn't moving towards us or away from us. Now the star is moving towards us. This whole thing is blue shifted. We can no longer see that line. This red line has moved into the less red area. That is how we measure the Doppler shift in stellar spectra. So when we observe a Doppler shift, we can infer that something is pulling on that star and causing it to jiggle. That's how we know it's an orbiting planet. Another thing you can see when you're looking at spectra is line broadening. So if you compare a low density gas to a higher density gas, the low density gas will have like thin absorption and emission lines. Whereas the higher density thing, you know, denoting like a higher pressure will have thicker lines. Line broadening allows you to look at the spectra of an object and learn about what environment that gas is in. And there's, there's so many things like that. There are so many things you can learn from spectra. I think these things are amazing. Like this is a miracle of modern science. Like this is so compact. I mean, it's incredibly expensive for like a person to buy, but for a lab to just buy, it's not expensive at all. And like any yokel can just plug it in and start using it. And that's amazing. That's super amazing. Uh, so let's talk about what you would even want to do with these. Like why? So I'm talking about the importance of spectroscopy. And I think I've argued that you can learn a lot of things about a thing from spectroscopy, but why would you use it? So here's the, here's the list. Here's a numbered list of things you can use spectroscopy for uh, in no particular order. But I think the first thing you think about when you think about spectra is that this is a test of quantum mechanics. So why does every element have a unique spectral signature? Well, it has to do with, with how atoms work. And quantum mechanics, you know, your quantum, quantum, quantum explains how atoms work. So the spectral Lyman lines of hydrogen, which are, they're in the UV, um, they were first discovered in the early 1900s. And no one really understood why, when you look at hydrogen in the UV, you get all these Lyman lines. They're called Lyman because the scientist was called Lyman. And then Bohr looked at this data and he was like, this only makes sense if energy is quantized. If you have a nucleus surrounded by these electrons that are only allowed to have specific positions. And when they lose energy, they emit light at a very specific wavelength, you know, indicative of how many shells they jumped. And when they gain energy, they jump and absorb light at a very specific wavelength. So the Bohr model of the atom explains the Lyman lines. The reason every element has a unique spectra is because every element has a unique allowable electron space, which produces different spectra. That is the reason. The reason spectra is useful is because quantum mechanics works. Of course, you could say like, well, Bohr was wrong and Bohr wasn't doing quantum mechanics. And like, yeah, of course. So quantum re mechanics replaces the Bohr model, but in order for one theory to replace another, it also has to explain every single other thing that that theory explains. So the Bohr model is a nice little cartoon of why spectra is unique, but of course, you know, electrons are clouds, uh, whatever. The quantum mechanical rules for jumping electron shells, you usually see diagrams like this, they are what we use to predict spectra. And sometimes spectroscopy is called applied quantum mechanics because everything we do with spectra is because we understand quantum mechanics. So if you tell a scientist you are going to mix two gases together at a specific temperature and pressure and like this is what the components of each of those gases are, you can use quantum mechanics to predict exactly what the spectra will look like. We use spectra to test quantum mechanics, but we understand spectra because we understand quantum mechanics. 
it's it's very important that these theoretical models we have for atoms actually explain the things we observe and what we observe is spectra and quantum mechanics even well quantum mechanics plus statistical mechanics will predict like that line broadening when you have like density and temperature of like a giant gas involved and quantum mechanics on its most basic level predicts the thickness of those lines in spectra because according to the uncertainty principle like you can't know the wavelength of a photon too well because that would be knowing its energy level and you have this un inherent uncertainty and that inherent uncertainty in quantum mechanics also appears in spectra but spectroscopy is used for a ton of other stuff imagine you're an engineer and you've built a combustion engine and you want to calibrate how the gas flows inside of it you could just stick a little fiber optic cable in there that's hooked up to a spectrometer and you could measure exactly what percentage of the gas has changed states or what percentage of the gas has interacted and you could connect that spectrometer to a little diagnostic you know a little blinking check engine light or something you could use it to test a new type of fuel and calibrate its efficiency uh, spectrometers are used in fundamental science applications but they're also used in like engineering diagnostic tools i'm just reading my list and i like really jumped all over i just wrote down the top of my head top five things I think about when I think about spectroscopy. So please, you know, add your own in the comments below. But number three, I wrote down infrared spectroscopy of the atmosphere. So if you want to, I don't know, predict how much it's going to rain tomorrow, you're going to look at the sky with a spectrometer and you're going to measure the, the cloud coverage. You're going to measure the humidity of the atmosphere, how much water is trapped in the atmosphere. You use data from your spectrometer to make predictive weather models. Uh, you use it to study the atmosphere if there's weather effects going on. And I don't know, if you want to look at an exoplanet, a planet far from our own, and determine what the atmosphere is like, you would just take a spectra of that atmosphere. Uh, that sounds like a crazy wackadoo idea because of course planets are reflecting light from their star but stars are very bright so how do you block out the star and observe only the planet but you know astronomers are really smart. This is one of the goals of JWST to see an exoplanet atmospheric spectrum. The people who are really interested in, in aliens and finding intelligent life in the universe are trying to come up with rules for like, what would the spectrum of an atmosphere of a community of intelligent species that were doing like coal burning or nuclear power look like? How could we tell from our vantage point what exoplanets have life and what exoplanets don't? And the only way we can do that is with spectra because we can't, we can't go there, right? Okay, um, number four, I have an O2 monitor here. So this is just a spectrograph. So this is tuned to the human adult finger and it uses absorption spectroscopy to measure how much your blood oxygen level is. And you know, if that drops too low, you have to go to the hospital. So all of these medical diagnostic tools, like these O2 monitors, x-ray machines, CT scans, MRI machines, they use a version of spectroscopy. It might not be in the electromagnetic spectrum, but they're like the grandchildren of the spectroscope, which was invented in 1860. And it's just, it's really amazing to see this technology be developed so rapidly for so many different uses over time. So for number four, I was talking about diagnostic tools in medicine, and for number five, I just wrote in medicine, but I mean something different. If you're making medication, like you're doing a bunch of chemistry with different molecules to produce a thing with a desired, very specific like structure and ratio of molecules inside of it, in order to tell what you have, you stick it inside of a spectrometer and you measure what it is exactly. Have you ever seen this guy, Nile Red, and he's like, I'm turning plastic into red hots or something. It's amazing and we all love to see it. But while we watch him do these little chemical reactions and like look at the color and be like, well, I know because this changed color that this reaction happened. I am constantly comforted by the fact that I am sure he has a spectrometer or like 10 different kinds of spectrometers in his little warehouse lab and he can just test to make sure that the reactions that he has done have actually happened, you know, before he puts that stuff in his mouth. 
I'm comforted by the fact that I'm sure that he does that. So that's what I'm talking about. Like when you make a pill that is supposed to be used by a human, you don't just want to hope that it worked, right? So you do the procedure to produce the medicine, and then you can use a spectrometer to test it, to make sure it is exactly what it is. But that's, that's not the only way it's used in medicine. So if you're doing like genetics and you're monitoring how proteins are affected by some specific procedure, you can do spectra of proteins and determine uniquely what that protein is, the same way you can do spectra on molecules and determine uniquely what those molecules are. And some of these guys are huge. Like you compare looking at one hydrogen spectra to like a giant macromolecule like a protein. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And th these spectrographs work to do that. And we don't have to rely on our eyes trying to pick apart different lines. We, we use software that can measure accurately what each little guy is. There is a chemical called a fluorochrome and you can take like a cell, a cell sized object and paint that chemical on the cell. And then when you do like a chemical reaction to that, it will light up. And then you can use a spectrometer to see those lights, measure those lights and know that whatever procedure you were doing on that cell worked. Here, here's a picture of a human cell with the fluorochrome on it. Isn't that amazing? You can just tag a human cell and it will light up in the spectrometer. It's amazing. I think this is like a modern miracle of science. Like look how compact this is. The software you just download from the internet and place on your computer and you open this box and you are taking spectra 60 seconds later. Every single like physics, chemistry, biology, genetics, whatever lab has a bunch of these and we can all just use them. And we don't have to sit there and calibrate these old spectroscopes and use our eyes and try to distinguish between lines. We're just using computer software to measure exactly how many photons of what specific, well, I mean within Within, within the bounds of quantum mechanics, we know what specific wavelength something is. And we can take giant, massive hydrocarbons and tell them apart using a little tiny spectrometer. It's amazing. It's amazing. These guys are amazing. And I hope I've convinced you that they're amazing. But anyway, let's go stare at the sun. So obviously, I, I'm not going to go outside right now. I already, I already took the spectra. Um, here's a picture of me doing that. I can't record outside. I'm not good at this. Anyway, if you look at the spectra of the sun, it's it's a black body, right? I mean, it's not technically a black body, but it's so close to a black body. They call this like a non-ideal black body. I don't know. There's, Guys, there's a thing that I feel like has been happening to my brain since talking about science to non-scientists, which is that at work, I do like space weather stuff. And if I said, you know, the sun's a black body and I drew the little black body curve and then we started calculating something, no one would sneeze. It would be totally fine. Like that's how people talk. But if I said the sun's a black body on a YouTube video and I didn't do the whole elaborate thing, well, it's not exactly a black body. It's called a not like I would get a bunch of comments about it. And I find that so weird because like that's just not how scientists talk like the the sun is a black body because it's approximately a black body and like that's good enough we we work in the bounds of like actual physical stuff you know and you look at this and you look at this and you say okay for all for all the math i'm gonna do the error bars and the fact that this isn't actually a black body don't affect my numbers at all. So the sun is a black body. But I feel like the public often think that science is just a bunch of definitions and definitively the sun is not a black body because like technically that's not what the definition of a black body is. But that's not how science works. Like approximately it is a black body. Am I making any sense? I don't know. I just, I wrote that down on my little notes. I was like, well, it's a black body. And then I was like, well, I guess not technically. And it's so weird. 
because I would never say that in real life. I would never say the sun's a black body. Well, not technically. I would just say, yeah, the sun's a black body. Look at it. It is. I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. Maybe I should go learn about science communication and figure out why people do that. Like, I, I don't know. I don't understand. So the sun's a black body, but when you look at the spectrum of the sun using a device like this, what you see is not a continuous spectrum from a black body. What you see is the emission spectrum of the sun filtered through the atmosphere. Um, so on the other hand, when you look at the emission spectrum of the sun on Earth, you are also looking at the absorption spectrum of the atmosphere which is kind of cool. Looking at solar spectra will tell you about the sun, but it will also tell you about the atmosphere on Earth. In a previous video, I talked about temperature, and I talked about how Planck allows us to look at an object, look at its emission spectra, and measure its temperature. Uh, one of the easiest way to do this is Wien's Law. So if you know the peak wavelength of your black body, you can get it by putting it in this equation, and that B is just a constant and you get the temperature of the sun. So you can take a spectra of the sun from your backyard and measure the temperature of the sun. So this is a real full circle moment for me. Like you measure the spectra, you get the temperature. We've measured the temperature. We've wrapped around. We've done the whole temperature thing. And that's kind of nice. Kirchhoff, if you lean closer to me, all of the history books will just crop Roscoe right out of this picture. And it'll just be us boys, the two boys, because we're best buds. Yeah, yeah.